Now for the news in detail. Pakistan has summoned a senior Indian diplomat to register its protest over ceasefire violations in the Lipa sector at the line of control. Pakistan's foreign office said India has committed 1,546 ceasefire violations and has martyred 14 innocent civilians so far this year. The spokesperson said Indian actions along the line of control are a threat to regional peace and stability. The Pakistani military's media wing said Indian forces fired heavy weapons and mortar shells targeting the civilian population. It said the Pakistani army responded effectively to the Indian ceasefire violation. Earlier, the Indian army martyred a young boy in unprovoked firing across the LOC. Indian troops have martyred two more youth in occupied Kashmir's Rajouri district. Occupation forces targeted the civilians during a cordon and search operation in Kheri area of the district. Indian forces have been accused of conducting fake encounters during the military operations. Yesterday, Indian forces killed two Kashmiri youth in a similar operation in Islamabad district, while Indian forces killed 61 Kashmiri civilians in the month of June alone. Indian atrocities in the occupied territories have sharply increased despite the COVID-19 outbreak. The occupied valley has been under New Delhi's crushing curfew and communications blackout for the past 332 days. Now, Islamabad says India is orchestrating terrorism in Pakistan to, divide, to divert attention of the world from its state crimes, especially in occupied Kashmir. In a statement, the foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, said India is constantly involved in subversive activities in the province of Balochistan. Qureshi said India is also trying to disrupt peace efforts in Afghanistan. The foreign minister said he has apprised the U.S. envoy Zalmi Khalilzad of the Indian role of a spoiler in Afghanistan. He said on the 29th of June, the attackers wanted to take hostages at the Pakistan Stock Exchange during the attack on the country's financial hub, Karachi. Meanwhile, Pakistan's special envoy for Afghanistan, Mohammad Sadiq, met with Qureshi. The foreign minister said Pakistan would continue playing a positive and constructive role for peace and stability in Afghanistan. COVID-19 is surging in the U.S. once again with daily deaths climbing to almost 1,200, while the toll has risen to over 127,000. In Brazil, the death toll has surged to almost 60,000, with 1,280 more fatalities in the past 24 hours. Globally, 510,000 people have died so far, with over 10.4 million infections. After registering a slight downward trend, the new coronavirus has made an aggressive comeback in the U.S. with over 46,000 testing positive overnight. While President Donald Trump pushes for mass reopening, 16 states have paused their plans to lift restrictions amid record surge in cases. Director Institute for Infectious Disease Dr. Anthony Fauci has warned the second wave could be worse than the first. We are now having 40 plus thousand new cases a day. I would not be surprised if we go up to 100,000 a day if this does not turn around. And so I am very concerned. Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro continues to ease social distancing restrictions despite alarming growth in the number of infections and deaths. The World Health Organization says the situation in Brazil is going to get even worse. The IHME estimates that under the current conditions in South America, countries such as Chile and Colombia will be seeing their peak of cases between now and mid-July, whereas Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, and Peru will see it at some point in August. The potential second wave of COVID-19 has forced a number of countries to reconsider lifting restrictions. Canada is extending the travel ban and its mandatory quarantine measures for foreign travelers and citizens returning home to July 31st. Australia too has locked down 300,000 inhabitants of more than 30 suburbs of Melbourne after a coronavirus spike. Well, Pakistan's COVID-19 death toll has reached nearly 4,400, with 91 more fatalities in the past 24 hours.
the health ministry said over 4,133 tested positive overnight, bringing the total to over 213,000. It said nearly 50% of cases have recovered so far, while over 2,700 remain critical. The ministry said about 108,000 cases are active in the country. It said the province of Punjab has reported the most overnight infections with nearly 1,800 cases. Sindh province reported almost 1,400 infections, while the capital Islamabad registered 128 infections. Elsewhere, the Dutch parliament has passed a motion calling for the government to prepare sanctions against Israel if it annexes the occupied West Bank. The motion was backed by parties with a majority of 87 lawmakers in the 150-seat lower house. The resolution was submitted by Socialist Party members. It said the annexation would be a gross violation of international law. The ruling VVD party and the Party for Freedom were among those that opposed the motion. On Friday, Belgium's Chamber of Representatives also voted in favor of a similar motion. Earlier, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he would start annexation of Palestinian territories today. Iraq says the U.S.-led international coalition has killed 11 ISIS militants in airstrikes in northern Nineveh province. In a statement, the Iraqi military said the coalition hit a tunnel used as headquarters for ISIS militants in Mosul. It said 10 militants were killed in the air raids, while another one was killed during inspection of the site. The operation came as ISIS militants intensified their attacks on security forces, including Hasht Shaabi forces. ISIS gained full control of Mosul, Saladin, and Anbar provinces and seized territories in Diyala and Kirkuk provinces in 2014. Iraqi security forces, though, have managed to regain control in subsequent years. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has urged the UNSC to indefinitely extend an arms embargo on Iran before it expires in October. Speaking virtually at a Security Council meeting, Pompeo said Iran is not a responsible democracy and must be held accountable. He said Tehran is already violating the arms embargo even before its expiration date. At the meeting, Iran's foreign minister Javad Zarif dismissed claims of aggression, saying it is the U.S. that has directly undermined global peace. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian said Beijing opposes efforts to put pressure on Iran. He said having quit the JCPOA, the U.S. has no right to trigger a snapback at the U.N. Russia's U.N. ambassador Vasily Nebenzia has described the U.S. strategy as a maximum suffocation policy. Nebenzia said Washington's task is to achieve regime change or create a situation where Tehran will not be able to breathe. U.S. envoy Zalmi Khalilzad has met with foreign ministers of five Central Asian countries to discuss the role of the C-5 in the Afghan peace process. In a series of tweets, Khalilzad said the leaders held a meeting in Tashkent and discussed how Central Asia will benefit from peace in the region. Khalilzad said they also discussed increased regional connectivity, trade and development after peace in Afghanistan. He said the U.S. appreciates the cooperation and assistance of the C5 plus one. The envoy said regional countries will need to work together for a political settlement when intra-Afghan talks begin. Khalilzad said they also discussed investments in each country and cross-border opportunities. The American envoy is scheduled to visit Afghanistan and Pakistan on his ongoing trip. Russians across the country are voting today to decide on major amendments to the Constitution. President Vladimir Putin has declared a public holiday to encourage voting. The proposed amendments comprise of 206 reforms. The most important of them, they seek to strengthen and extend President Putin's rule potentially till 2036. Putin, though, insists the changes are to guarantee stability, safety, well-being, and a decent life only through development. The Russian constitution currently permits a limit of two consecutive presidential terms, six years each. 
I'll be back after this break with plenty more news. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The EU has condemned Venezuela's decision to expel the bloc's ambassador, urging Caracas to reverse its move. In a statement, the bloc said the move would result in further international isolation for the Latin American nation. The bloc said it will summon Venezuela's ambassador in Brussels to protest the move. The EU's foreign minister, Joseph Borrell, said Brussels will reciprocate out of necessity while urging a negotiated solution to emerge from the crisis. Earlier, President Nicolas Maduro expelled the EU's consul after the bloc sanctioned 11 Venezuelan officials. Venezuela's opposition leader, Juan Guaido, has said Maduro's decision will isolate the South American nation. The dictatorship today is becoming more isolated and Venezuela is suffering the consequences. I am grateful to the European Union for the humanitarian aid it has offered Venezuela. But the reality is that Maduro has no standing to break relations with countries that do not recognize him. It is clear that the dictatorship is forcing millions of Venezuelans out of the country, more than 5 million of whom are now refugees. One protester has been killed and several others injured during largely peaceful demonstrations in Sudan. Tens of thousands of protesters took to the streets nationwide to demand greater civilian rule in the transition towards democracy. Police fired tear gas to disperse protesters marching on a road leading to the airport in the capital, Khartoum. Waving Sudanese flags, demonstrators gathered in Khartoum and its twin cities, Khartoum North and Omdurman. Similar protests also took place in Kassala in eastern Sudan and in the restive region of Darfur. They chanted freedom, peace and justice, the slogan of the movement opposing al-Bashir. The Million Man March was called for by the Sudanese Professionals Association and Resistance Committees. In Libya, five more corpses have been discovered in a mass grave in the western city of Tarhuna. The government's search team says the bodies were unearthed during excavation work. They said the total number of corpses removed from the area has now reached 24. So far, 11 mass graves have been discovered in and around the city. The GNA said Tarhuna once served as the main assembly point for Eastern Commander Khalifa Haftar. Turkey says 60 migrants are feared dead after a boat sank in the eastern Lake Van. Speaking to reporters, Interior Minister Suleiman Soylu said no survivors have been found so far. Soylu said authorities had detained 11 people in connection with the incident, which took place on the 27th of June. He said six bodies have been recovered while search and rescue operations are underway. After an investigation in the villages that have been staying, inquiries with the village elders and him, we had reached a conclusion that the boat was carrying an estimate of 55 to 60 illegal migrants. Now, Turkey, which hosts about 3.7 million Syrian refugees, serves as the main crossing point for migrants trying to reach Europe. On to Iran now, where 19 people have been killed and six injured in an explosion at a hospital in the capital, Tehran. State media quoted senior officials as saying the blast was caused by a gas leak. Rescue officials said victims include 15 women and four men. They said people in the nearby Tajrish Bazar rushed to the scene, which impeded rescue efforts. Officials said the healthcare facility had 25 employees inside at the time of the blast. Last week, a similar explosion occurred close to a military site near Tehran, but no deaths or injuries were reported from that incident. In the U.S., racial equality activists and some lawmakers have rejected New York City's planned cuts to the $6 billion police budget, saying it falls short of demand. The city council said $484 million will be slashed, while $354 million will be transferred to other city agencies in the 2021 fiscal budget. 
As some lawmakers refuse to budge on major downsizing of protesters, or officers I should say, protesters continued their demonstration outside City Hall. A minority of left-wing legislators vowed to oppose the budget, while protesters said the government must push for parity throughout the city. Elsewhere, former Atlanta police officer charged in the Rayshard Brooks murder case has been granted a $500,000 bail. Over in Mississippi, Governor Tate Reeves has signed a bill to replace the current state flag that includes a Confederate emblem. There are people on either side of the flag debate who may never understand the other. We as a family must show empathy. We must understand that all who want change are not attempting to erase history. And all who want the status quo are not mean-spirited or hateful. Meanwhile, the Austin Police Department has put five officers on administrative leave amid a probe into the use of force during May's George Floyd protests. In Ecuador, authorities have installed cameras on the streets of the capital, Quito, to check if people are social distancing. Ecuador has been one of Latin America's worst hit countries, with over 56,000 COVID-19 cases and more than 4,500 deaths. More on that now in this report. The health system of the Ecuadorian capital is at its maximum capacity due to demand for beds in intensive care units. On Monday, 50 seriously infected people were waiting to be admitted to these units. With the outbreaks in downtown Quito, authorities became concerned. They came up with the idea of this artificial intelligence technology in the hope that it will help stem the tide of new cases. We are very concerned with the increase in infections in some suburbs of the capital. In coordination with authorities, there are to be restrictions in the historic center. Unfortunately, that is where there has been an increase in the number of cases. These smart cameras are able to track the distance between citizens out on the streets in the capital city. An audio alert is then issued that warns citizens their health is at risk if they don't practice social distancing. Inter-American Development Bank is backing this smart camera initiative across the region. What the Inter-American Development Bank has done is made available this security tool to all Latin American countries. Ecuador is the first to quickly implement it. President Lenin Moreno has ordered three actions to limit the spread of the virus. Greater controls of movement in areas with larger number of cases, strengthening operations to curb informal trade, and increase in the attention capacity of the public health system. The Oscars voting body has invited a vastly diverse group of 819 new members to adjudicate the awards. The Academy for Motion Picture, Arts and Sciences says it has exceeded a goal set four years ago to diversify the group's membership by 2020. Amid a historic movement for racial equality in the U.S. and scathing criticism of an overtly white jury, nominees and winners over the years, the Academy of Motion Picture, Arts and Sciences has broadened its spectrum to a more diverse range of adjudicators. The Oscar So White movement highlighted a lack of black actors nominated for the film industry's top awards. This year, invitees from 68 countries have been asked to join the jury. Eva Longoria, Zendaya and Aquafina are among the new class of invitees, which is 36% people of color and 45% women. In a statement, among the new members, several stars are from the South Korean black comedy Parasite. The Academy said with the new list, 33% of the Academy's 9,000% members are women and 19% come from underrepresented racial or ethnic communities. European stocks have edged into positive territory as economies continue to open up to businesses. Investors are monitoring economic data signaling the extent of a potential economic recovery post-COVID-19 lockdowns. London's FTSE has gained fractionally, while Germany's DAX has traded over half a percent up. 
France's CAC 40 dipped slightly after making early gains, riding the optimistic investor sentiment. Most Asian stocks gained after a private survey showed Chinese manufacturing activity in June growing more than expected. Time now to find out what the weather is like around the world. For the latest updates on these and other stories, you can always follow us on our social media at Indus.news. Thanks very much for watching.